Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started here. Thank you everyone for joining this meeting open to the public for the Oregon Department of Forestry's Western Oregon State Forest Forest Management Plan and Habitat Conservation Plan update. Uh, we've appreciated having these meetings with you over the past couple of years. I think we see some new faces here. So excited to um, have some new folks joining these meetings. I'm Sylvia Chubrowski with Kearns and West, just helping to facilitate today. And before we dive in, I'll just go over some meeting logistics and our agenda, and then we'll turn it over to Liz Dent to provide some opening remarks. Um, so just in terms of meeting logistics and remote participation tips, we encourage um, everyone to stay engaged and stay on mute when you're not speaking. Use video when you are speaking just to promote that face-to-face -face communication. And as we're all getting to know each other, it's always helpful if you say your name and affiliation so that we know who we're hearing from. Um, we are hoping to have most of the conversation in the room today. So if you have questions, comments, please, please bring those out onto the table and just use the chat uh, feature for troubleshooting. If you have any technology issues throughout the meeting, you can get in touch with Aaron Bothwell, who can help solve those issues for you. Um, and if you have any kind of more substantive comments that you want to provide or additional questions, you can email those to Jason Cox at the email address here, and Aaron will put that uh, in the chat as well. And she's also put in the websites for the Forest Management Plan and the Habitat Conservation Plan so that you can get more information and stay engaged. Um, and I also want to note that Oregon Department of Forestry is kind of changing their email service. So you've probably been on a group email, getting emails about these projects and it's switching over to Gov Delivery, I believe. So emails might be coming from a new email box, which sometimes means they go through your spam. So just check your spam. And if you're not getting emails, get in touch with Jason Cox, who can help with that. Um, all right, I think we're all Zoom experts, but just some reminders of the platform, because sometimes it changes mute buttons on the left here. Um, we encourage you to let us know who you are through your participant name. So if you click on the little participant icon at the bottom, that'll bring up the list of participants and you can find your name, find a blue button, and then find the rename thing and tell us who you are. First, last name and uh, affiliations appreciated there. And then when we get to the Q&A and discussion portions of today's meeting, um, we encourage you to raise your hand to get in the queue. So if you find the reactions button at the bottom, there's a raise hand feature there. Um, and then of course, chat is available for troubleshooting and issues. Okay, and our agenda for today. So we're gonna start with a review of forest management plan and implementation plans, kind of what are they, the overview, hoping to get everyone on the same page and level the information that you all have about the process. Um, and then we'll provide an update on the forest management plan engagement, as well as the draft goal and strategy development. So if you are with us for our last meeting open to the public back in August, you know that we went over the uh, uh, Oregon Department of Forestry went over draft goals for the forest management plan. You all provided great input, also provided input through a couple of other stakeholder meetings and um, a public survey. And so today ODF will kind of go over what they heard and some updates to the goals and also provide some information on development of the strategies to support the goals for the forest management plan. And then after that, we will have an update on the habitat conservation plan, um, as well as the NEPA process that is ongoing as part of the habitat conservation plan. And then we'll move into summary next steps. And we always have kind of an extra hour at the end of this meeting for just any informal discussion on topics of interest. So we have kind of our formal agenda Q&A from about two until four o'clock, and then ODF will stay on the line from four to five to just continue the conversation. So that's our agenda for the day and just some discussion guidelines. You know, we hope to honor the agenda to make sure we get through all the pieces that are important to inform you all of. Um, we hope to provide a balance of speaking time. So when we get to Q&A and discussion, you know, we wanna make sure we hear from everyone that has questions or that has comments. And we also encourage you to listen to understand and ask questions to clarify as much as possible while respecting each other's points of view um, and focusing really on the topics at hand. And um, also some project information. If you have additional questions after today, 
there's contact information here for um, the Habitat Conservation Plan contact is Cindy Kolomachik, and the Forest Management Plan contact is Mike Wilson. And we'll put that information in the chat as well. And we'll have um, ODF staff introduce themselves when we get to different portions of the agenda later on today. Okay, so with that, I am gonna hand it over to Liz Dent to provide some opening remarks and then we can dive in. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, as always, really first wanna start uh, by thanking you all for being here. It's really important and valuable for us uh, that you're taking the time to review the work that we're providing and to provide um, feedback for us. It really is gonna help uh, make a better product. So thank you all for um, your continued in engagement. I think at this point, everyone kind of um, is tracking uh, with the work that's getting done, but I am just gonna um, sort of put out the lay of the land for you. We are in the midst of a really what is turning out to be a holistic planning process for the management, for the policies and management for Oregon's state forests. And so that includes really three planning levels, the habitat conservation plan, um, the forest management plan, and that which are both big uh, large scale sort of policy documents with strategies in them, and then implementation plans. And those implementation plans are written at a smaller spatial and temporal scale. They really get more into uh, what actually is gonna take place on the ground over a, a shorter time period than say the HCP and the FMP are, are written. So those three planning processes that, you know, there's, um, it can be sort of hard to track all these different pieces, but they do need to support and complement each other. And so that's why we've been building uh, from the HCP, then the FMP, and ultimately the uh, implementation plans or IPs will all come together. So this is that stage where particularly the HCP and FMP are really starting to come together. As far as the HCP uh, process, we uh, last um, spring, earlier in the spring completed our first administrative draft of the Habitat Conservation Plan. It is on our website and uh, it's currently going through the NEPA process. This is a federal process. Um, and in that instance, um, they are heading up um, all of the um, technical work and the engagement with the public. Any changes to the habitat conservation plan moving forward will be facilitated through that federal process. And you'll see that um, as time uh, rolls out, the best place to comment will be through the draft um, environmental impact statement or EIS. We expect that to be out um, early next year. Um, so the draft EIS will come out public has an opportunity to comment, and then the federal services uh, take that information and work towards a final draft of the EIS. So that's the process of the HCP. It's very much in the hands of the federal agencies at this point, NOAA Fisheries and US Fish and Wildlife Service. For the forest management plan, um, our process with you all so far has really been dedicated to early engagement. So we're, um, the way we're framing up this process is to share content with the public and our county partners and stakeholders um, while it's being developed. So that's why we started with the goals, get the public engagement based on what we hear from you, take input, possibly make revisions, and then bring that to the Board of Forestry. Give them a chance to look at it and give their own feedback while we and then we move on down the line, the next piece being to a draft a set of strategies, as um, Sylvia said, that support the goals. And so same process with the strategies, bring those to our county partners, to the public, to stakeholders, to tribes, get that input, and then again, bring that to the board and keep moving down the line. So um, again, your engagement here really helps uh, to give us a better product and um, just encourage you to keep working with, uh, with us on this. So uh, to, 
uh, at the next public meeting, um, we anticipate um, sharing the strategies. Um, we have had a delay in our timeline, so you uh, may have noticed um, the expectations for what we thought we could do today are a little bit different. Um, all kinds of reasons for this. Uh, we certainly, as most of you are aware, had a very big fire season and um, many of our state forest employees participate in the complete and coordinated system for fire suppression. So it really just took away some focus time that we typically would have um, on this type of policy work. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Sylvia. Yeah, thank you, Liz, appreciate that. And we'll have more information a little bit later today on what that continued public engagement process looks like and kind of the expectation for upcoming public meetings and stakeholder meetings where hopefully those strategies um, will be the topic of discussion. Um, so before we get into the FMP update, we also just wanna kind of hear who's in the room and we probably don't have time to do a large round of introductions, but we do have a poll that we're gonna launch now just to get a sense of who's in the room. So if you don't mind just letting us know, the poll should have popped up, whether you're kind of how you identify yourself, conservation group, county elected official, federal or state agency, general member of the public that's interested in the project, whether you're part of one of our um, HCP committees, industry representative, recreation, or tribal representative, or other, just so we kind of get a sense of who we're hearing from. Um, and as that is rolling, I think I will just go ahead and hand it over to Mike Wilson at ODF to provide an overview of the forest management plan and implementation plans and provide some context um, and the various planning levels so that you all kind of get ingrained in what these plans and policies are. Um, and then we'll have time for some Q&A after that. So go ahead and share the PowerPoint and we'll stop, stop the poll in just a few minutes after a few more folks have participated. So Mike, hand it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Mike Wilson. I'm the Deputy Division Chief for Policy and Technical Support for the State Forest Division. And today uh, I'm going to go over the FMP process um, with you. We'll give you a brief update on uh, the feedback that we received on the goals, uh, also the timelines going forward uh, and so forth. So uh, to start out with, I think we can uh, go to the next slide. And I just wanted to give the context for today's discussion and uh, keep the conversation focused. Um, so what we're here to do, like I said, is go over the uh, draft goal uh, feedback and some timelines. And this applies to our draft forest management plan for state-owned forest lands that are west of the crest of the Cascades uh, from the Columbia River to the California border. And this is about 614,000 acres of board of forestry lands and about 26,000 acres of common school forest lands. The management context for these lands can be found in state statutes and rules, uh, including the greatest permanent value rule and the state forest planning rules. And so for today's meeting, we wanna keep the discussion focused primarily on the draft FMP goals uh, and that feedback. <clears throat> we'll also address the timeline for the draft uh, FMP engagement opportunities uh, in the future. So other things such as other state forest lands outside of the FMP discussion, uh, the current NEPA process for the draft HCP, uh, private forest lands and the Forest Practices Act, and federal forest lands are out of scope uh, for today's discussion. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so next slide. So uh, with the geographic scope of what we're talking about today, uh, the blue lands uh, shown on the map here are the Board of Forestry lands, the salmon colored lands, which uh, are difficult to see. Um, they tend to be in smaller scattered uh, parcels in and amongst our ownership. 
uh, are the common school forest lands. Uh, as I mentioned, there's about 614,000 acres of Board of Forestry lands and 26,000 acres of common school forest lands. Okay, next slide. So uh, just to give you a, an overview of the planning context that we use or the planning hierarchy, um, we have the FMP and HCP, uh, which are highest level documents um, that really provide the high level forest management plan goal and strategies. Um, in this case, uh, since we're doing it in conjunction with the draft HCP effort, the HCP actually provides a majority of the conservation strategies uh, at least for the, uh, for the covered species, which will also, uh, as a result, cover a lot of the needs of other native wildlife under the FMP. Below that, uh, as Liz mentioned, we have our implementation plans, and those are sub-geographic plans. Uh, currently, we do them by district. That might change under our new FMP. We may, might choose a separate uh, sub-geography to uh, conduct our implementation planning. Um, and those have mid-level objectives, uh, goals, and plans uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the planning area. Currently, those are 10-year plans. They will probably remain uh, decadal plans. Um, and that's where you really start to see uh, some more of the numbers uh, around actual uh, anticipated annual harvest volumes, uh, habitat uh, outcomes, and so forth over that next 10-year uh, period. <clears throat> Annual operations plans uh, detail the specific management um, for the upcoming fiscal year and describe how those uh, plans fulfill the implementation plan objectives. So we have a tiering down of, of our uh, stair step there of our planning efforts. And today we'll be talking about the forest management plan. Okay, next slide. And so just a little bit of a content of what's in the uh, plans, a uh, little bit more detail in the forest management plan uh, and also the authorities here. Uh, the forest management plans are adopted by the Board of Forestry and they are adopted as administrative rule and with a finding that the plan meets greatest permanent value. These are really long range plans. They are not necessarily time bound uh, they're meant to be adaptable. We revise them. Uh, we actually review them every 10 years. And they contain guiding principles. Uh, and those are guiding principles, not so much for the management of the lands, but for how the plan uh, uh, addresses the management of the lands, which is a little bit of a nuance. Um, more specific to the management of the lands, they contain goals and strategies for the management of forest resources, and then also guidelines for implementation, for asset management, and for adaptive management, uh, as well as implementation levels, uh, which are tied to funding. Implementation plans are approved by the state forester, um, and they are designed, as I mentioned, to achieve the goals of the FMP. Uh, currently, those are district specific. That is the sub geography that they currently uh, address. So they're a mid range plan. And currently, and in the foreseeable future under the new plan, they will be uh, uh, 10 year plans. And they contain the district uh, overview of key resources and land ownership, the management opportunities, the annual harvest objective, the current forest structure and the desired future forest conditions. Again, annual operations plans, which are approved by uh, district foresters, achieve implement or basically show how we achieve the implementation plan objectives on an annual basis or progress towards that. They are district specific. Uh, they are fiscal year plans. Uh, they contain the description of harvest operations and other specific forest management projects such as timber sales, habitat improvements, young stand management activities, recreation activities, road management projects, and monitoring and research. Okay, next slide. So while the FMP uh, sets forth the goals for the resources and strategies for achieving those goals, 
There are other external influences that contribute to varying degrees to the breadth of the resources addressed, the goals that are set, and the strategies for achieving those goals. In this way, the FMP <clears throat> provides uh, overarching management direction for state forests and is formally adopted into OAR, uh, Oregon Administrative Rule, by the Board of Forestry uh, to codify that the management meets GPV. And so here we can see some of the external plans that had varying levels of influence on the forest management plan. Um, and there are others. This is just a set uh, example, a uh, few examples. And so we'll see some that have uh, quite a bit of influence, such as the habitat conservation plan, which by virtue of its uh, biological goals and objectives and conservation actions, uh, directly uh, dictate some of the goals and strategies uh, under the FMP uh, related to the covered species. As I mentioned before, uh, most of those conservation actions will also address other native wildlife. Uh, it's not the entirety of the native wildlife, however, and that's where the Oregon Conservation Strategy comes into play. Uh, the Oregon Conservation Strategy is ODFW's document, uh, for management of native wildlife. And it provides information and tools that allow land managers to um, further develop conservation strategies. So the FMP strategies that correspond to the Oregon Conservation Strategy will be broader than the draft HCP conservation actions, both in the assemblages of species addressed and the specificity of those strategies. Um, Next up, we see uh, the Climate Change and Carbon Plan, and that is currently in development, which will guide climate smart forest management to provide forests that contribute to carbon storage and are resilient to the effects of climate change. And both of those things, uh, resiliency to climate change and also carbon, uh, produ uh, carbon stored in state forests and also in harvested wood products from state forests, uh, will be uh, addressed in the goals and strategies under the FMP. <clears throat> um, and then ODF's recreation, education, and interpretation uh, strategic planning will form the basis for REI goals and strategies within the FMP. Uh, that strategic planning is currently ongoing, so there are concurrent processes uh, in, in all of this. Um, and so the goals for, uh, that you'll see for recreation, education, and interpretation are like a lot of the other goals, uh, fairly high level in the FMP, and the further detail will be uh, in the implementation plans. So the FMP, uh, you'll see in the blue box there, uh, also contains the guidelines for asset management, implementation, and adaptive management. Implementation plans, monitoring plans, and the adaptive management plan all flow from the FMP goals and strategies, and annual operations plans uh, in turn uh, are used to fulfill the implementation plan objectives. So most importantly, performance measures will be developed that contain specific metrics and targets that will demonstrate the progress towards FMP goals. While the performance measures will not will not be the only metrics monitored under the FMP. They provide the essential dashboard uh, for the Board of Forestry and others. And so I would like to call particular attention to the box at the, at the bottom, uh, the green box at the bottom of that uh, column, adaptive management. And adaptive management is really the hub of what goes on with our forest management planning. Um, it is directly informed by the Habitat Conservation Plan, which has its own adaptive management section, and also uh, additional FMP adaptive management uh, questions. You'll notice uh, right above that, the monitoring plans that uh, go with the implementation plans also relate to the adaptive management plan uh, in terms of more specific uh, monitoring objectives on a shorter time scale. Most importantly is the red arrow that flows around the outside of the diagram and comes back to the performance measures. And this is really the tie back to the FMP and uh, shows how the adaptive management plan and the performance measures 
and the results from that guide uh, changes uh, to the FMP from future revisions. Okay, with that, uh, next slide. And so if there are any uh, questions or discussion about what we just uh, covered, be happy to take those. Yeah, thanks, Mike, appreciate that. So any questions about the forest management plan in general or any of these pieces? All right, and Nancy, go ahead with your question and just a reminder to say your name and affiliation so we get to know each other. Nancy Webster, Rockaway Beach, North Coast Communities for Watershed Protection. And I and probably, I really want to emphasize that where is drinking water in this whole process? I, you know, I heard about forest products and carbon storage and, you know, the wildlife, all of those are really, I mean, wildlife and carbon storage are really important, but living here on the coast, we're seeing community after community struggling with drinking water issues this fall, this summer. And it's, we believe a crisis and most of these are sourced in forest water areas. So um, is there a mention of drinking water? And uh, thank you. So yes, good question. Yes, there uh, is. Uh, the are we have very we have two uh, major goals that we'll review in a little bit that have to do with both aquatic and riparian resources. One of those goals is tied more to fish uh, and stream health um, from that uh, from that angle, and then we also have a specific drinking water goal as well. And um, could I? at some point hear what that goal is? Yes, we'll be reviewing those. Okay, thank you. Section of the yeah, yeah, thanks Nancy. We'll go over all the goals in just a minute. Um, Jason? Yeah, um, had a question sent to me in the chat. Um, could you please explain why the HCP has a one-way arrow from the adaptive management box? Uh, why would there be no feedback return arrow to the adaptive management box on the slide there? That's a good point. Um, I really love flowcharts. Um, not really, uh, but <laughs> so there actually is, however, it comes through the forest management plan. And so the HCP uh, is incorporated into the umbrella of the FMP, which is the overarching document, contains goals and strategies, and also that monitoring becomes uh, actually realized through the forest management plan uh, and implementation plans. So uh, it's not immediately apparent, but there is that feedback loop uh, there between the adaptive management plan and the HCP. So the adaptive management plan itself does live outside of the FMP um, and it incorporates both some very HCP specific questions and then also uh, FMP specific questions. So uh, apologies that we uh, were looking at that the other day and trying to think about how to simplify that flowchart a little bit to make some of those relationships more apparent. Thanks, Mike. Okay, let's go to Brett and then Michael and Greg. Uh, thanks. Uh, Brett Brownscombe with the Wild Salmon Center. And, and yeah, Mike, the part where you were talking about the um, performance measures and the connection to adaptive management, I think I mean, may, maybe it's worth just talking about it later or as the meeting goes on. But um, one of the, I think the overarching question that we have is, okay, how much of the FMP is going to contain, here are the commitments. These are the things that will be done versus the IP level versus all of this is subject to adaptive management, um, it's gonna be more flexible. And I don't know if you can add any more color on that, but I think just overall, it speaks to, you know, the desire, at least in the conservation community for like, okay, where do we find certainty as things move out of an HCP that may go for 70 years or, you know, any holder of an HCP can decide it's not working and drop it. Whereas the FMP is the thing that actually gets translated into the OARs. 
Sure. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so the HCP, um, and we're still actually uh, determining the best way to incorporate that into the FMP, um, but it will be incorporated uh, by reference uh, at a minimum. And so those strategies actually become part of that whole OAR equation. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we look at the HCP as being a 70 year contract, which is which is pretty committed. Um, but really, uh, more to your question, uh, the standards that are either in the HCP, and I think uh, a number of, of you are probably familiar with those uh, by this point within habitat conservation areas and uh, riparian conservation areas are pretty clear. There are additional standards, which I think is what we're really getting at here, uh, that will be within the FMP. Uh, certain aquatic resources, say uh, uh, wetlands that are not connected to streams and that sort of thing, will be uh, covered in the FMP as actual standards. Um, a lot of what we get down to in terms of the amount of management, the pace and scale of management really changes with the IPs. And so that becomes apparent there. Um, a number of things uh, are actually still contained in operational policies, um, which are more subject to change. Uh, they really represent more along the lines of our own internal procedures and processes, and also best management practices. Um, so uh, certain, uh, uh, certain prescriptive elements are not contained in the FMP. The strategies are intended to uh, basically encompass a range of uh, avail uh, available tools that we could bring to uh, bear for implementation plans and annual operations plans and so forth. Um, so there will be some additional standards in FMP uh, in the FMP, um, but uh, implementation plans are really where you're going to see the more concrete objectives. Thanks, Mike. If I help answer the question, Brett. Yeah, th thank you, Mike. Thanks. All right, let's go to Michael Calhoun. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Michael. I live in Vernonia, Oregon. I'm board chair of the Upper Nahalem Watershed Council and assistant zone two director for the Columbia Soil Water Conservation District. I really um, do want to echo Nancy's concern and question that uh, drinking water uh, will be brought up. It, it sounds like it will. I very briefly just wanted to kind of why I feel that's important. Right outside my window is Rock Creek. It's the sole source of water for the city of Vernonia, a tributary to the Nehalem. This summer, the city of Vernonia hit a level four water curtailment, which has never happened in our history. And I am disappointed and concerned that the only protections for Rock Creek are in general, the Oregon Forest Practices Act. There's nothing specifically for drinking water. And when you compare that to the, the Bull Run Reservoir, it's disappointing in a number of ways because what it says to me is that those in power devalue citizens based on the population of their community. That if only we were bigger, we would have stronger protections for uh, surface water sources for drinking. So I, I just, going forward, I hope that um, that's reaching people in power here on this uh, forum, that, that we, we are asking for better than what we have now, and, and we do deserve better. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. And Liz? Yeah, I also want to uh, say I appreciate that, and you raised some really good points. Um, we are committed to protecting drinking water. And so as we move through this process, really want to make sure we stay engaged on that. Have visited quite a bit uh, with Nancy and Pam, I believe, over the past several months. Um, so yeah, let's keep talking about it. I am pretty sure that just to clarify, uh, because it's important um, to note that uh, the Rock Creek uh, watershed area is predominantly not uh, state forest ownership. So 
I know that that's probably not the, <laughs> the topic necessarily that you're raising now, but sometimes it gets a little bit confusing and confusing in these public meetings, but really trying to distinguish uh, in terms of policy, um, those land ownership patterns. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, and Greg? Hi, I'm Greg Jacob, environmental representative with the State Forest Advisory Committee. Question for Mike. Uh, when it comes to um, the issue or the topic of herbicide spraying, is that discussed at FMP level or the IP level? And is it subject to change as the months roll along? You might get input from the communities. That's a great question. Um, it will be addressed in the FMP. Um, that is one of those areas where the FMP is not going to be prescriptive uh, down to you know, particular limitations. However, the FMP strategies, uh, there are a number of them, a couple of them at least that you'll see that have to do with uh, early seral habitat. And part of that is our management of, uh, uh, well, basically how we implement the use of herbicide. And from the state forest perspective, we don't really like to use herbicide uh, more than we feel is necessary uh, to, uh, you know, basically to assure a successful reforestation effort. Um, but the particulars on that are, would be seen both in implementation plans and annual operations plans in terms of uh, what you might see as the uh, uh, potential amount of use. Primarily in an implementation plan, um, what will be out there in terms of the amount of uh, clear cut harvest versus partial cut harvest um, lens, uh, you know, will give some indication on how many acres might receive herbicide treatment. And then in annual operations plans, it becomes much more apparent of what the actual uh, reforestation and young stand management activities uh, will be for the upcoming year. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And Pam. I think you're still on mute. I can't find the unmute, unmute button. If you kind of hover over the screen, it should be at the bottom corner. All right. You can well, also kind of hover over your own window there of your video of yourself and it could have uh, you mute and unmute. There we go. Oh, geez. Sorry. We, you, you got it, Pam. We can hear you now. Okay. <clears throat> The Oregon Department of Forestry slide on Route 30. The Oregon Department of Forestry was responsible for hiring a contractor which cut a section of forest ODF owns on Route 30 by the Harmony Heights development. Knowing it had an unstable soil type underlain by the slide prone a story of formation, they took a Las Vegas risk. The Clatsop County landslide potential soil maps containing the areas of Harmony Lane, Macy Drive, and Liberty Lane east of Astoria off of Route 30 are marked high risk for landslides. This highway is a vital corridor for employment, commerce, medical needs, and emergency services. I would really like the Oregon Department of Forestry employees to be much more thoughtful consider county soil maps, the Department of Geology and Mining Industries, Dogami, ODOT, and watershed data. And Pam, really appreciate yes. your comments here, but yeah. this is a meeting but of the I, forest management plan. So just, we're, we're hoping okay. that the comments and questions can get stay, stay focused on that. Yeah, but I wanted to know how much money they made and how much it costs to clean up that slide. It ruined a lot of people's lives. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Pam, appreciate it. I'm Pamela, not a spray pan. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the name says Pam. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah. Okay, well, with um, 
I think we can keep going then. Mike is gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the forest management plan timeline and we can review a little bit on engagement that's coming for the next few months. Uh, stop for questions and then we'll move into the draft goals and it sounds like everyone's kind of itching to get into that conversation. So we'll just do a little bit on the process, um, take some questions and then move into the goals and get comments on drinking water and other issues that are important to this group. So Mike, back over to you. Okay. And is the uh, presentation back up? Hold on just a moment. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, um, okay, so now for uh, the forest management plan engagement update and also the organizational structure, go to, uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so, um, what we have here is a, a broad outline of the organizational structure for the FNP project. Um, we have, uh, of course, at the top for the uh, FNP approval is the Board of Forestry and for IP approvals is the State Forester. <clears throat> um, below that, uh, we have a project uh, sponsor and steering committee for this made up of department uh, uh, executive leadership that oversees the uh, project as a whole. We have a leadership group um, that consists of uh, a number of our uh, department leadership at the uh, district forester and division level um, to, uh, that helps to steer the overall decisions with the uh, FNP and coordinate that work. Uh, a project manager and coordinator uh, to actually keep all the uh, all the cats herded, um, and most importantly, and doing most of the work is the core project team, uh, which includes not only our technical specialists but also our field staff and our key division planning staff as well. Um, and these folks are the ones that are expert you know, they serve as our experts on forestry and biology and aquatics and riparian, um, transportation, and so on and so forth that really do um, all the work uh, associated with this. Um, we also have an extended uh, subject matter expert uh, group um, and operational advisory group. Uh, operational advisory group uh, consists of our operations coordinators and other field staff to make sure that the strategies that we're writing uh, are actually implementable. The subject matter experts, which are technical experts that help the core project team with the goals and strategy development. <clears throat> we also have a number of, uh, we have contractors and consultants helping us out, um, Kearns and West, for instance. Um, and we are in the process of uh, getting, uh, uh, there is a request for proposals out on the street um, we will be uh, uh, awarding a contract to provide additional technical support for FMP planning and also for um, the implementation plan work and ongoing implementation uh, as needed. Um, but most importantly, this box uh, partner agencies that are external to us, a uh, big shout out to ODFW, DEQ, DSL, um, for um, helping us um, get basically get our strategies uh, aligned um, with uh, with other state agency objectives. Um, these are the same folks that have served on our HCP uh, scoping team to help us put together strategies for the HCP. Uh, so very productive relationship and also able to kind of bridge that gap between uh, the work being done on the HCP versus the work being done on the FMP. Okay, uh, next slide. <clears throat> so um, here we have uh, the timeline uh, moving forward. Uh, where we're at today in October, um, 
and we have a, a meeting open to the public. Uh, basically, we're still uh, uh, discussing the draft goals that will be presented to the uh, Board of Forestry in November. Um, at the same time, we are engaging the forest tran our forest trust land um, county partners uh, to get their input on the goals. Um, so that meeting was had uh, recently just on the 8th. So all of that is in preparation for bringing uh, the guiding principles, draft forest management plan goals, uh, and the uh, future engagement plan to the Board of Forestry in November. So that's where, that's where we're at uh, now. Um, <clears throat> important note, what you're gonna see here today is largely what we are bringing to the board. Uh, we are not uh, trying to do all the work to finalize goals at this point. Uh, even after we uh, go to the board, they will still be draft goals. Um, we are basically seeking their input and feedback and direction at each stage here, but nothing will really be finalized until we have a full uh, final draft of the FMP and the board uh, tells us to go forward into rulemaking. And so in between now and then, uh, we will also be working on forest management plan strategies. We had originally intended to bring those to you today uh, those draft strategies, but uh, as Liz mentioned, with fire season and uh, capacity issues, we did have to slow that timeline a bit. And so you'll see in March of 2022 is when we will be bringing those strategies to the board. And in preparation for that, in December, uh, December 7th, uh, we'll be having another meeting open to the public to present those draft strategies two joint stakeholder meetings, uh, one on December 9th and the other on December 13th uh, to uh, do further work with uh, stakeholders. Um, also a meeting with the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee on uh, December 3rd uh, on those draft strategies as well, all in preparation for us to be able to uh, bring those draft strategies uh, in March. And so those are the next big points of engagement um, with you all. Um, looking out further, uh, we plan to bring a uh, draft FMP with modeling outcomes, uh, and this will include uh, the uh, adaptive management guidelines, asset management guidelines, and implementation guidelines, uh, basically the full package to the board in June. Uh, for their consideration and feedback. And then in September, we plan to have the uh, full draft um, of the FMP and uh, ready to go, ready to enter rulemaking so that the board can adopt uh, the forest management plan by uh, in uh, February of 2023. Okay, next slide. So again, those upcoming key dates are November 3rd, uh, presenting the revised draft goals to the Board of Forestry. Uh, December 3rd, uh, uh, the draft strategies being rolled out to the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee. The, uh, then the December 7th meeting open to the public and December 9th and 13th joint stakeholder meetings. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I just want to add a little bit to this piece, just in terms of the engagement process um, overview for the FMP and the Habitat Conservation Plan. The general process is that, you know, we do work with um, some of the internal committees for the Habitat Conservation Plan, the steering committee, and um, the scoping team. And then when information is ready to come to the public, we have meetings open to the public and we follow those up with stakeholder meetings. Um, and often we have these stakeholder meetings sort of on the calendar and invite stakeholders to attend. And we're, ODF is also open to additional meetings with folks. Um, if there's uh, a one-on-one -on -one that you'd like with ODF or um, a more focused meeting on a particular topic that you hear about in these meetings, just reach out to the team and happy to provide that space for you. 
And if you haven't heard about the December 7th, 9th, and 13th dates yet, that's because we haven't put out any emails about them, but those will be going out shortly. So this is the first notice. Um, and for the December 7th meeting open to the public, everyone that got an invite to this meeting today, you will have received an invite to that meeting. And for the joint stakeholder meetings, those are a little bit kind of smaller and don't tend to be promoted through ODF's main um, uh, distribution list that goes out to all members of the public. So if you aren't getting those emails, just let us know. You can email Aaron Bothwell. The emails for the joint stakeholder meetings usually come from our Kearns and West facilitation team. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to say on engagement. Oh, right. For the habitat conservation plan, there's also additional engagement as part of the NEPA process for the habitat conservation plan. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later in today's meeting. All right. So with that, just we'll stop for a minute for any questions or thoughts on that overall timeline and some of the engagement pieces before we head into discussion of the draft goals for the FMP. So any questions on the, the process or anything you heard just now? Okay. Great. Then I think it's going to be back to Mike again to keep going on the forest. Man oh, sorry. There are a couple of hands here. Um, Jason, go ahead. Thanks. I got a question in the chat, which was, um, and I see, you know, I see the person in the room, Deborah, who asked this. So um, there needs to be a little back and forth. Maybe she can jump in. But the question was, uh, where is ecosystem wide impacts being included into the planning and implementation process? Um, and I don't want to speculate as, as to any more than that. Maybe Deborah could clarify if folks, if anyone needs that. So I guess I'll uh, start out by saying that um, the modeling outcomes for the FMP will deal with a number of different uh, um, items. And, you know, of course, there's always uh, timber harvest, there's habitat um, estimations uh, around other ecosystem services will largely depend on what the board finds important and uh, what they want to see as measurable outcomes. Uh, from that uh, from that modeling process, ideally those will be key, uh, tied back to what they believe would make good performance measures for the plan. Um, but yes, uh, any follow up question? Well, I guess I I feel strongly that looking at the impacts on the whole ecosystem is a really wise piece that was in the the Northwest Forest Plan. And it was reached with a lot of input from a lot of different people. And I, I value that, that that speaks for an overview rather than one that is more narrowly focused on interests of more commercial interests in, in industry. So just hoping that that is shared by others. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh... So it, and it will be, and it will also be part of a picture of, there will also be uh, HCP outcomes uh, from the draft environmental impact statement uh, that is in the final environmental impact statement that goes along with the HCP. And those are two different sets of modeling outcomes. I wanna be very clear about that. They're two very different you know, processes around the EIS versus our own modeling around the uh, sort of refined modeling around certain outputs for the uh, forest management plan. And so uh, a lot of those higher level uh, ecosystems uh, questions, uh, effects on water quality and quantity, and um, uh, also habitat there as well, of course, and socioeconomic outcomes and so forth, will also be presented uh, there. They won't be the same processes, but they will address a number of the same things. Can I, can I add another piece? Um, I guess others probably recognize how complex this process is as well as me. I mean, looking at that last handout, it was like, whoa, <laughs> trying to take it in. Um, what, what I'm wondering about, I noticed that there are a lot of categories where there might be voices who are not in, in 
sync with the way that Forest Plan is operating now. And I'm wondering how how well do people get to have their opinions expressed and how likely is that to create some actual substantive change in how things are? So there are a number of, uh, a number of uh, engagements there. Uh, all of this that we're doing currently on the, at the uh, FNP and HCP level is, uh, engagement to really try and get folks involved early so that we can do what we think is the best job of, of putting together a plan. Um, associated with any of our planning levels, uh, our public comment periods, uh, whether it is the forest management plan, which will have a public comment period, uh, official public comment period associated with the adoption of the administrative rule, or the comment periods that go along with our implementation plans and uh, annual operations plans. So there are various places to provide uh, different levels of input uh, and different levels of specificity um, in all of our planning and operations. Like the DEQ speaking up for clean water. <laughs> well, yeah, let's that's a big part of what we're doing now, um, you know, working with DEQ uh, on our uh, plan strategies. Um, and then of course there are, I mean, there's a monitoring component in there for them too, as well, uh, in conjunction with us. Thanks, Michael. It, it, if I could just quickly weigh in as well, I really appreciate the question. And, and I just wanted to speak to the piece about people that may not be tracking what's going on. and. It is our intention to be as inclusive as, as possible. So if we're missing someone, um, or if you if you know of someone um, that you think you know we should be reaching out to, really invite that. Um, we do our best, but certainly would appreciate that. And it is complex. You're right, and I some because it is complex. I mean, the work is really complex, and we're at a place where we're bringing together some work that the Department of Forestry, not necessarily our division, has been doing on climate change and carbon sequestration, rolling that together with the HCP and the, you get it. And that's why there's all those lines. So we're really trying to represent that this, these all have to be thought of collectively, which goes to your question around ecosystem services um, in order to be the most responsible we can be as, as stewards of these plans. So really appreciate the conversation. Looking to, uh, we'll definitely think about um, if there's a way to simplify that representation of bringing all that information together um, and yet letting people know we're, you know, we're aware of all that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Liz and Deborah. Okay, see a couple more hands up and we do still have a lot to get through today, but also wanna make sure to answer any burning questions. So let's go to Pamela and then Greg. Hi there. Hi. I would like to know when you're gonna, I have a minor in geology. I was a ceramic engineer and design person. And I know a lot about geology. And I'm wondering when you're gonna address soils that are unstable. I would really like to know that. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we do have uh, a, uh, currently a draft goal that we'll review in a few moments uh, that does have to do with soils. It is fairly high level, uh, but the draft strategies, which will be coming out in December uh, have more particulars around uh, soil protection, including unstable slopes. Thanks, Mike. And Greg. Well, uh, Michael, on the previous slide, looking at the timelines, I, I saw where the HCP, regarding the HCP, that the board may move to adopt it in the fall, February of 2023. Uh, pre but was there a public comment period before that date? That's my simple question. Uh, yes, there, there will be a public comment period, both on the uh, what's called the public draft of the HCP and the draft environmental impact statement that will be coming up uh, early next year. 
Uh, and uh, I think I'll uh, maybe save that until Cindy gives her part of the uh, part of the update. Yeah, we'll have Michelle McMullen with NOAA Fisheries is here to help with some of that as well. And uh, yeah, uh, real quickly, because it reminds me of the other point I wanted to make is that in addition to all these point touch points with uh, stakeholders or county partners, um, rural communities is always an opportunity to testify to the Board of Forestry, so directly to the board. And you can do that in written testimony, or, um, in verbal testimony, or both. So, and they really do pay attention to that. They like to get those comments a little bit ahead of the actual board meeting so they can really read those uh, before they have that um, discussion. All right, thanks, Liz. Okay, so now let's move into the forest management plan draft goals and go ahead and share screen and turn it over to Mike to walk through um, the goal development and then kind of the feedback that was heard on the goals over the past couple of months. Okay, great. Um, so uh, what, what this uh, slide shows is basically the steps in the goal development that we've taken so far um, and our next step um, as well. So, um, our core team and subject matter experts internally uh, originally developed uh, draft goals, uh, which went through an internal review. Uh, again, that's our operations coordinators, our leadership and executive sponsors, and also our partner uh, state agencies, <clears throat> which uh, that feedback was taken by the core team to revise uh, the goals further and uh, went through another round of leadership uh, review. Um, and what we uh, basically we uh, notified and shared uh, content with the Board of Forestry uh, for that input as well to get their feedback, early feedback on it. Um, and then uh, in August, uh, we had a public meeting to present those goals and gather more feedback. Uh, we put out a survey. Uh, to, uh, to gather uh, feedback after that meeting as well. And so then the core team and subject matter experts reviewed that, uh, revised that draft content in some cases further, uh, and in some cases really just uh, provide, summarize the input to provide to the Board of Forestry, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, and uh, uh, basically the range of that input. Um, as well as you'll see input from the Forest Trust Lands Advisory uh, Committee in there as well. And so now we have summarized that feedback and we are working on the staff report and presentation materials to uh, deliver that to the Board of Forestry at the November 3rd meeting. Uh, and then we, will we expect to receive more feedback and direction from the board based on uh, the, the their view of uh, or their reading of the feedback and their reaction to that from the feedback from FTLAC and the public and stakeholders. And so the uh, next thing that we will be doing is uh, after that is continued uh, refinement of the goals and technical writing. So with that, I think we're ready to jump into a uh, actual review of the goals and this, uh, bear with us with the scrolling. I believe we're gonna share the actual uh, PDF. Is that right? Yeah, just a second, one moment here. Okay. All right, perfect. So um, basically, we're just, I just want to go through these fairly briefly. Um, I believe a link to this document is uh, in the chat. It's on our website, uh, right? We, so just going to tell you about what we heard overall and uh, what sort of revisions we might have uh, made so far. So these goals are in no particular order. They are not prioritized uh, in importance or alphabetical even. They're just, uh, they're just out there. 
So um, our first uh, goal for forest health was ensuring healthy, sustainable, and resilient forest ecosystems that over time help achieve environmental, social, and economic goals to benefit all Oregonians. That goal received very strong support um, with very little opposition. Uh, we received a lot of valuable uh, comments. Um, there was a recognition that forest health itself is not necessarily seen as a forest resource by a lot of folks, but more of a lens through which we manage the forest, which is true. We also heard that about climate change. Um, and also that uh, there were various, uh, was various input uh, around what constituted forest health, uh, the acknowledgement that drinking water and water sources were very important. And so we have not actually made any, uh, as well as, I'm sorry, as well as some uh, specific um, recommendations around Swiss needle casts and other problems that we currently, uh, forest health issues that we currently uh, wrestle with. Um, currently, we have not made any revisions to this goal. Uh, basic, we wanna hear the board's uh, uh, feedback on, on this feedback um, before we take uh, further revision. Okay, so climate change was the next one. Uh, and lead by example in demonstrating climate smart forest management that supports climate adaptation, mitigation, and achievement of forest resource goals. And this also received overall support um, with relatively little opposition. Um, again, climate change not being viewed as necessarily a forest resource, which is true, it's a condition we're responding to. Um, and it is a lens that we will uh, look through as we, as we form up the rest of the plan. Um, if we could scroll down just a little bit more. <clears throat> we have not made any uh, revision based on the feedback that we received at this time. Uh, the board is uh, going to be um, uh, the climate change and carbon plan, which is uh, one of those overarching plans that we looked at that has an influence on the FMP. Um, the board is currently, uh, has been uh, uh, discussing and uh, revisions have been made to that document. And I believe they're teed up to uh, adopt the climate change and carbon plan in November. So we didn't wanna to get too far out in front of that. Um, but uh, we got a lot of good feedback on that. And it's a lot of the same feedback they've gotten on the the uh, climate change and carbon plan itself. So uh, those two uh, very closely tied to this goal. Wildlife, um, protect, maintain, and enhance the functional and resilient ecosystems and landscapes that provide the variety, quality of habitat types and features necessary for long-term persistence of native wildlife species. Again, strong support for the goal. Um, a lot of, um, uh, particular comments on what would uh, what that would look like to folks. So very good feedback. Um, none, uh, no revisions at the time of this report. Um, and so we'll look forward to hearing the board feedback on that. Aquatic and riparian, uh, again, uh, two goals uh, here in this, uh, under this uh, forest resource. And the first one has to do with maintaining and protecting and restoring dynamic, resilient, and functioning aquatic habitats to support fish and riparian dependent species. Um, again, strong support for this goal uh, as well. Um, some uh, feedback on the wording and also about adding water quality and quantity to the aquatic and riparian habitat goal. Um, <clears throat> we did have a uh, revision uh, based on that feedback. And so the updated draft goal is protect, restore, and maintain dynamic, resilient, and functioning aquatic habitats, including high water quality and healthy stream flows that support the life history needs of aquatic and riparian dependent fish and wildlife species. Okay, and so next one, and this is more specific to drinking water. Um, the goal was maintain and protect forest drinking water sources that provide a high uh, quality drinking water for public and for private and public domestic use. Um, strong support uh, for that goal as well. Um, basically, there, uh, there was a significant support to change the resource type to drinking water and add water quantity to the goal. 
Uh, we have not actually changed the uh, resource type uh, at this time, but that is still uh, certainly under consideration and is uh, likely in a future revision. Um, uh, support for reducing the use of pesticides uh, and uh, some other, other feedback as well. We uh, did update this goal uh, based on some of the feedback to protect, restore, and maintain forest drinking water sources that provide high quality drinking water and predictable water quantity for private and domestic use. So trying to get at that quantity uh, uh, issue there. Okay, next goal, uh, a pollinator goal around providing suitable habitats across the landscape for that contribute to the maintaining uh, and enhancing native uh, sensitive and endangered pollinator and invertebrate populations. Um, strong support for this goal as well. Uh, uh, support for using the reducing the use of pesticides. Uh, also some indication that folks wanted to see the soil food web uh, incorporated. Um, also, the desire to lump pollinator and invertebrates into wildlife, which uh, certainly they are. Uh, we haven't taken any, uh, we haven't made any changes to this goal at the time of the report. For plants, uh, maintain understory vegetation representing a diversity of native uh, vegetative associations and several stages across the landscape, including sensitive and endangered plant populations. Again, uh, strong support for this goal. Uh, again, the focus on reducing or eliminating the use of herbicides um, and acknowledging the difference between early seral communities um, uh, themselves uh, and their functions that are uh, resulting for disturbance. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and some other uh, suggestions around uh, shifting uh, silvicultural management to achieve those goals. Um, also, the acknowledgement of fire risk here is understory vegetation uh, in forest stands. So uh, we have not, we are potentially going to add the word, oh, excuse me, something just popped up in front of me there, but uh, uh, potentially adding the word uh, restore and into a larger conversation in the uh, restoration. Uh, Goal. Okay, next. Uh, okay, timber production. So we originally had two goals here that focused on the two different types of lands that we manage, the Board of Forestry lands and the Common School Forest lands. Um, those goals weren't really well received in terms of their land type. Also, they were essentially mostly a rehash of statutory language uh, or rule language that already exists. Um, but about around providing uh, for the Board of Forestry Lands, providing sustainable and predictable production of forest products uh, that generate the revenues and jobs for um, the state, counties, local taxing districts, and communities. Um, there was really a desire from the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee, committee who has a uh, clearly a vested interest in, in uh, this particular part of the, uh, uh, these particular outcomes. And they really uh, suggested uh, emphasizing timber production benefits and highlighting the importance of public services <clears throat> that are provided with those revenues. And so rather than, uh, and people were generally, there was some overall confusion about goals that were tied to two different land types. Uh, it was a bit lost on folks and, and that's fine. Um, so what we did, uh, what we actually changed this first goal, um, to a more revenue uh, focused goal. So if we could scroll down just a little bit. And in the italics, you'll see uh, provide revenue that supports public services in rural communities provided by the state, schools, county, and special districts. So that focuses to the distribution to the counties uh, from these lands, and then also the uh, income to the common school fund uh, from the uh, common school forest lands and the services that those provide to communities and people. Overall, there was still pretty strong support for this goal. Uh, there was more opposition uh, uh, than for some of the other goals that we've been looking at. Um, if we scroll down to the next uh, goal, 
similar levels of support and opposition uh, for those. This is the one that had been focused on common school forest lands uh, that really did not resonate with folks. And so rather than uh, we completely replaced this uh, with an updated goal to provide a sustainable and predictable supply of timber that provides economic opportunities, jobs, and the availability of forest products. And so that gets more at the harvest and forest, uh, forest sector side, recognizing jobs in the woods and uh, just the general availability of forest products. Okay. <clears throat> so forest carbon uh, was pretty broad, contribute to Oregon's carbon stores within state forest lands. Um, as you'll see, there was uh, mostly support for this goal, um, some, some opposition. Uh, but basically strong support. There was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of suggestions about how to achieve that. Um, from the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee, uh, they would uh, they uh, wanted to note that uh, we store the carbon stored in harvested wood products. Um, that's a legitimate point. Um, we do not control. Um, necessarily what happens to those wood products, but we certainly do provide them and they have the potential uh, for that storage. So we updated the goal to contribute to carbon sequestration and storage both within state forest lands and in harvested wood products. Okay. <clears throat> For air quality, maintain and protect healthy air quality standards uh, that received strong support. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, interest in uh, slash burning uh, and actually wildfire and also even uh, pesticides there as well. Um, and uh, retaining old growth trees. Um, we have not made any changes to that goal uh, at this time. For soils, uh, maintain, protect, and enhance soils. Um, again, a strong level of support for this uh, goal. Um, a lot of input around uh, what that means, recognizing also though the uh, value of uh, carbon storage in soil and uh, then trying uh, basically some misunder or uh, lack of under, uh, we weren't communicating it well, I should say, what enhancing soil means. Um, so it was rather uh, vague for some folks. And so the updated goal there is to maintain natural soil processes, protect soils from damage and increase soil carbon. The next goal for uh, wildfire, <clears throat> uh, strong support for the goal of mitigating the risk of wildland fire effects on forest production, wildlife habitat and landscape function and supporting wildfire resilience of local communities. Uh, there, was, there were a lot of comments on this. There were somewhat conflicting views on how to manage older stands uh, or to mitigate the fire risk. Um, and uh, considering how we use fire in our management and so forth. Um, so the updated goal is to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildland fires to communities, forest production and wildlife habitat and aquatic systems and manage forests to enhance community and landscape resilience. Okay, next uh, goal. We had a couple of goals associated with recreation, education and interpretation. Um, the first one uh, really focuses in on the high quality, uh, providing high quality forest recreation, interpretation, education opportunities to create meaningful and enjoyable experiences, which foster appreciation and understanding of forests and contribute to community health, forest stewardship, and economic well being. So, really trying to recognize the outcome there that we want people to feel tied to the forest, uh, that we want them to uh, really get out there and have a good experience. And that goal received uh, 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 largely uh, received support there, um, and with some language suggestion, uh, language suggestions uh, in there, and also the uh, uh, desire to balance logging and recreation infrastructure, and make state forests inclusive and in prioritizing access for communities that haven't felt safe or welcome in the past. Can you scroll down just a little bit, please? 
And so we are considering adding a deeper interpretation uh, and education strategy to really get to that underlying uh, whole, uh, you know, get that uh, holistic range of content and balance of values. Our second goal really had to do with uh, managing the recreation infrastructure and how it uh, 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 basically uh, impacts other forest resources and reducing those uh, conflicts. So again, received strong support for this goal. Um, we did receive uh, uh, feedback on, on how it relates to wildlife and some other uh, strategy development. Um, so the updated goal is to manage recreation, education, and interpretation infrastructure and recreational use in an environmentally sustainable manner that seeks to minimize adverse impacts to natural resources and forest ecosystems. Okay. And then for the transportation system is managing the transportation system to facilitate the anticipated activities in a manner which provides for resource protection, transportation efficiency, safety, and sound fiscal management. Um, and this goal received some, uh, still received overall strong uh, support. There were some mixed uh, uh, comments on this, um, basically around the impacts of roads, uh, of the desire to not vacate roads uh, for access. Um, also, uh, some issues associated with hazard tree removal along highways um, and only allowing clean transportation on the road network. So a number of comments there. Uh, we have not made any uh, changes this time to that goal. For the scenic goal, um, manage forests in ways that value scenery and forested settings that are visually appealing. Uh, overall, receive strong support for this goal. Um, some uh, questions or some input around what is or isn't uh, visually appealing, and the note that it is highly subjective, um, that is true. Um, we have updated this draft goal to manage forests in ways that value scenery and a range of forested settings. Okay, next goal, uh, mining, agriculture, administrative sites and grazing. Uh, and the goal is to permit mining, agricultural use, administrative sites and grazing when resource use is compatible with other forest resource goals. Um, this goal received uh, pretty mixed reviews, uh, pretty much uh, split between uh, supporting and opposing. And so some of the key themes that were uh, received was uh, that these goals just were not compatible with healthy and sustainable forest ecosystems, uh, that they shouldn't be grouped in one goal and uh, support for the potential economic and social benefits of these activities. Um, we have not made any revisions to this goal, these goals, uh, this goal, sorry, uh, at the time uh, of this report. Special forest products uh, provide opportunities to obtain special forest products. Um, this uh, had uh, fairly strong support. Uh, there was a little bit more uh, confusion around um, this one, basically mostly around the fact that the goal language is fairly vague in general. And so we uh, updated the draft goal to be a little bit more specific, uh, provide opportunities for the public to sustainably harvest a wide array of special forest products for recreational, personal, and commercial use, including but not limited to firewood, salal, moss, mushrooms, et cetera. So trying to call out what those are a little bit more and, and what we're really trying to speak to in terms of access. The cultural goals um, are still uh, under uh, development in coordination with the federally recognized tribes. Um, the general level of support, we didn't, there was not actually a survey on this. We did accept feedback, um, one of which was engage the tribes in development. And uh, then recognizing and addressing the diversity of communities of people. So we haven't made any changes to uh, these goals yet because they're still in development. Okay. Um, so we also did uh, receive both in the comments uh, from the survey and from the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee and others, uh, some uh, 
some input around that led us to two new goals that have been drafted. One around community well-being, uh, establishing strong relationships and mutual trust with communities of place and communities of interest who have connections with Oregon State Forest. Covers a broad variety um, of, of situations, um, essentially uh, people who have historic economic ties, people who have uh, historic uh, cultural uh, ties that are not necessarily tribal. Um, just trying to recognize that people have a lot of different ties to the forest and it's deeply woven into their social fabric. Um, and a goal around forest restoration specifically to increase forest resilience uh, through restoration by assisting in the recovery of ecosystem function across the landscape in areas that have been degraded or damaged due to biotic or abiotic factors. So recognizing both disturbances like uh, fire and also things like invasive plants. Other goal suggestions that we have not um, adopted yet, and many of them uh, were really uh, spoke a lot to strategy uh, around uh, the use of chemicals and uh, collaborating and uh, coordinating with our other state tribal <clears throat> and federal agencies. Um, social justice, uh, again, to really integrate um, other communities uh, into our forest management uh, processes. And uh, uh, focus again uh, uh, throughout a num num number of comments and then as a suggestion for a goal of identifying priority management around mature and old growth forest characteristics. And a focus on rural forest develop dependent communities uh, to keep them vibrant and resilient and, they, and that they benefit from active forest management. We hope to uh, address that through the community well-being goal. And then wood products uh, with uh, basically focusing on Oregon's forest continuing to enable that local production sustainable of sustainable and renewable uh, forest products for uh, those uses. So that was a lot of talking. Uh, and uh, be happy to, uh, oh wait, um, let's see, actually, I think we have one more slide to go through before we get to our next, a uh, okay. couple more before our next uh, questions. Is that right? Great, thank you. So next up to support the goals um, <clears throat> is a strategy development. And so the core team uh, and the subject matter experts have drafted that content. <clears throat> it has undergone internal review again through from the ops coordinators all the way through leadership and state partner uh, agencies. Um, and, and the core team has uh, made some revisions uh, and are continuing to make a few revisions uh, based on that. So right now we are uh, still, we are in the process of uh, the leadership group reviewing and approving that for more uh, for external sharing. So the next steps will be to notify and share uh, with the Board of Forestry, Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee and the State Forest Advisory Committee and then uh, getting external input as well uh, from the public and stakeholders. Uh, again, those two dates uh, are actually a, a date range here. Uh, that uh, review, so I, we mentioned the dates on the calendar of December uh, 3rd for a meeting open to the public. And then I believe it was the 9th and the 13th for the uh, joint stakeholder meetings. But during this period from December 7th to January 3rd, um, we'll be accepting the uh, re uh, external review and input. And then we will loop back uh, uh, on that, circle back on that in January to uh, review and revise those and submit them. Um, but, and then we'll be uh, drafting the uh, staff report so that we can submit those draft strategies to the board in March. Okay, next uh, slide. 
And um, so anyway, the, uh, the continuing the draft content, basically what I uh, just shared uh, for you is uh, through all, all stages of this, we develop the draft content, we get the review and approval for external sharing. Uh, that includes uh, working with our partner state agencies and then getting the draft content out to the Board of Forestry, Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee and State Forest Advisory Committee. Uh, then getting that draft content out to the public uh, for review and input. Um, then presenting the information uh, and discussing it in these meetings uh, so that we can review the input and revise. Okay, with that, I think uh, we're ready for questions. Great, thank you, Mike. It's a lot of information and thanks for sharing kind of the feedback that was heard and how some of that was used to update the goals. Um, we'll open it up to questions. We are a little bit behind and we wanna make sure we have time to go over updates to the Habitat Conservation Plan and the NEPA process as well, but also wanna make sure that we answer questions here. Um, so Ron Byers. Thank you. Uh, I live on uh, Trash River outside of Tillamook uh, and I'm interested to know at what point do you weigh and prioritize these goals in a way that we can tell what's more important than something else? So that's not so. Uh, the only way that we would really prioritize these goals is through the Board of Forestry directing us to prioritize one goal or another. Um, we, you look at these goals uh, in a balance of trying to achieve greatest permanent value. And we do not put any particular uh, prioritization on them as staff. Uh, any prioritization that we would give them in a final plan would be based on Board of Forestry direction to do so. Board. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. And Pamela? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that I need a report from the Department of Oregon Forestry to know what happened on Route 30. And I never got a report. Thank you, Pamela. And we're actually gonna chat you with some, um, with some information to be able to continue that conversation in just a minute here. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on the forest management plan goals or just kind of any reflections on what you heard here? Uh, Brett? Yeah, and thanks, Mike, for going through all that. It's, um, it is a lot, and uh, it looks like there's, there have been revisions along the way. And I guess, I mean, maybe first off, like given the diversity of people that are in these public meetings, we could probably all um, talk or argue ad nauseum about <laughs> goals yeah. and what they should be and what should be yeah. in and what should be out. So recognizing that at some point, ODF's got to move forward with something and you've got a checkpoint with the board on that in November. Um, what so, I mean, the one of all the stuff in there, I think the one that I'm still not sure where it fits is what the department's proposing to do related to um, the issue of steep slopes and landslides and kind of what, if you've got strategies in mind on that, which I think you do, like where they would go, what goal they would tie to. So they tied to two different goals. And this is part of, um, part of the process that we're going through now is strategy mapping. Uh, and that uh, basically will show which strategies go to which goals. So any given strategy is gonna affect multiple goals, right? Um, and so where you'll primarily see that uh, show up is in, of course, the soil protection goal, but then also the aquatic and riparian uh, goals in terms of delivery to, to the aquatic system. Um, and then just the overall uh, steep slope uh, goals. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that, I don't know if this helps, but in thinking through like, there's probably 
looking out into the strategies and not knowing, you know, knowing ODF hasn't proposed any yet, but um, they're to come. There are probably multiple strategies that serve multiple goals or any given strategy could serve multiple goals. And you can envision this, um, I mean, almost a diagram that ties strategies back to multiple goals. And I mean, one thought on it, knowing that ODF is getting a lot of pressure to um, either prioritize or shrink the number of goals or like you can't be everything to everyone. So why is all, why so many goals? I almost feel like um, if there are goals, like current draft goals that just don't have too many strategies tied to them, is it really worth having, how, many, how much value is that in, in you know, having that goal? And I mean, you could almost imagine some of these around, um, um, the view sheds issue or the, the culture issues just seems a bit like a um, never ending conversation about what that means. So I don't know, you, you, I can almost envision a process where the FMP could lay out and here are the, here are the goals and strategies that map to them. And then here are the other public values that the FMP is supporting. And if you just don't have a lot of strategies already in mind that are going to be supporting those goals, maybe cover them more generically. And I guess the last comment, um, and I'll shut up, is on on the roads issue. It just feels like I know certain people aren't going to want to see any roads vacated or decommissioned, but that's just not realistic in the context of what the HCP would likely say. So if the HCP is going to say it, um, and this I think gets down the road to like, is the HCP going to move forward and is it going to move forward concurrently with the FMP? I I would hope that ODF would say it in the goals. Like if the density of roads are going to decrease over time, but um, those that are really important for administrative sites, acts, public access, wildfire, um, where there's you know there's a strategy to maintain um, those those uh, objectives. Like we're not going to close all those roads, but if the density is going to decrease and that's the intent over time to deal with aquatic and other interests, um, I would hope that the goal would say it in the FMP to reflect the HCP and um, some people might not like it, but at least it would reflect the reality, I guess. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, and I see a few more hands up, but I also know we have an HCP presentation um, coming up. I wonder, Nancy, are you available to stay for the kind of informal discussion at four? Yes, and I can I make just one quick comment. Sure. Um, we we're talking about, um, I think Ron brought up and Brett is, you know, there's a lot of goals and a lot of competition. And I feel that drinking water is a common right and need. And if we protect drinking water, we're protecting the fish and the plants and, and the habitat but, and carbon. But without drinking water, we're really screwed here on the coast. And it, we in Rockaway have been screwed. And then I think other people on both public and private lands are really afraid of the future of water and the future of living in these communities. And so to me, the priority has to be drinking water at this point. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks thank you, for, Nancy. you know, that there's more mention of drinking water. So thank you. Thank you. And Lisa, do you wanna just make a quick comment question? Thank you, uh, very briefly. Um, I really appreciate the fact that in the final slide, there was a mention of awareness that the public would like to see ODF take protective action regarding the use of herbicides in forestry. And that thread seems to impact many of the goals. Uh, the use of herbicides is tied to clear cuts, it's tried, tied to the health of wildlife and fish, certainly to drinking water impacts pollinators and invertebrates goal. Uh, 
algal blooms wasn't mentioned, but that impacts drinking water and other water quality. It's tied to community health. It's tied to air quality and the climate change goal. So let's hope that we can really uh, together bring attention to the need of ODF to adopt a more protective goals regarding the use of herbicides. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Darlene? Okay, so it was interesting to see the new goal of um, uh, restoration and it's sort of interesting my reaction to that. And I'll see what happens when the strategies are brought forth. I am a restoration ecologist. So you'd think I'd be real thrilled with this, but my big concern is um, post-fire logging because for um, areas within the HMP and the riparian zones, I think that is um, generally inappropriate except for hazard trees by roads or, you know, that are well used. So anyway, I'm just looking for what comes out of strategies for that. Okay. Thank you, Darlene. Um, and Pamela, we'll get to your question in a minute. Let's go ahead and move into the HCP and NEPA update first, just so that we get that information out there for everybody. And I'm going to hand it over to Troy Ramick to kick us off there. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Hi, everybody. Troy Ramick with ICF. I'm the project manager for the HCP, supporting ODF in the development of that work. Sharing my screen here. Okay, let me now get everybody situated. So um, I'll just kick us off and then uh, hand it over to Mike for a couple of minutes, and then I'll be back with you. Uh, what we wanted to do today, we don't have a, a lot of uh, slides or a lot to say, but um, uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of an update um, of the kind of review process that's been ongoing uh, since we last spoke with the public on this and some of the changes um, that are happening on the HCP right now. You'll hear more in a little bit um, from Michelle McMullen from NOAA Fisheries on what's happening with the DEPA process uh, as well. Um, part of what I'm, Mike and I are going to talk about are just some uh, brief updates on some of the covered activities, um, how they're characterized in the HCP, and then a brief update on a couple of the conservation actions that are being slightly modified as well. So I will um, hand it, Mike, to you if you want to take care of the covered activity section, and then I'll come back in a second. Sure. Um, so the changes uh, that we're currently making uh, are uh, discussing with the scoping team um, for the, uh, that will result, uh, you'll see them in the public draft of the HCP that comes out. Um, they are the result of an internal operational review um, by our staff uh, to basically find things that might, uh, that, to make sure they understood how they would be implemented um, and also some other uh, clarifications and corrections. And so those will be reviewed by the HCP scoping team um, and be incorporated into the HCP. Um, so basically it is about clarifying uh, the implementation and consistency across the document and to better align with the intended outcomes of scoping team discussions. Um, and then a number of conservation commitments uh, were moved from chapter three where they were kind of tied in with covered activities to chapter four, the conservation strategy. Um, so for herbicides specifically, um, ODF has chosen to remove herbicide application as a covered activity and the covered activities and effects analysis will be updated accordingly. And this essentially had to do with some of the process involved and dealing with herbicides in the HCP and that process um, that actually unintentionally could have uh, made it more difficult for us to adopt newer chemicals that are actually safer as they came on uh, line. Um, and so that's why we're really uh, relying on this process for the FMP, for the implementation plans and the annual operations plans as we go forward uh, to uh, make adjustments to herbicide use. So we'll continue to be working on the on uh, herbicide use uh, policies with uh, input from the Public and Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee uh, and our other stakeholders and tribes uh, as well. Um, 
So roads, uh, we pulled landings and water drafting and storage under, under the roads as a covered activity rather than standalone activities and updated the description of landings to include the roadside uh, landings, uh, turnouts that are often used uh, uh, for thinning. Uh, for quarries, we updated the definition to quarries, borrow sites, and stockpile sites. Uh, we made uh, clarified, uh, revised uh, language around water drafting to make it clear when and how water drafting would occur. And then for recreation infrastructure, we are updating information in the HCP to include our best management practices. Uh, for recreation infrastructure and are having ongoing discussions internally and with the scoping team. Okay, and then, um, so Mike just covered some of the updates we've been making to the covered activities um, as a result of the operational review internally. A couple of other things that have been um, modified uh, in, that you'll see uh, changed in the public draft HCP uh, have to do with the conservation strategy and specifically uh, conservation strategy eight, um, which if you haven't been following along with the process or, or looked at a recent draft of the HCP, there are 12 conservation um, actions listed in chapter four of the HCP. And so I'm looking about talking about two of them here. Conservation uh, action eight is uh, deals with activities that are outside of habitat conservation areas and um, in the, in the public draft, you'll see some clarification on the definition of Northern Spotted Owl Dispersal Habitat. There's a commitment in uh, the biological uh, goals and objectives to maintain 40% uh, northern 40% uh, of the area outside of habitat conservation areas of Northern Spotted Owl Dispersal Habitat. And um, there were just some discrepancies in how that was defined and described across the HCP. So we just trued that up uh, in, this, in this new version. Uh, and then similarly, there are requirements for leaf trees, snags, uh, and downed wood retention um, that are uh, described in Conservation Action 8 and just added some clarifications, mostly to Table 4-12. So if, you, if you're ever in the HCP and looking at Table 4-12, that'll be uh, modified uh, somewhat just to make it more clear how those actions will actually be implemented um, on the ground. And then Conservation Action 10 is a, is a um, kind of a, a sweeping conservation action that deals with lots of different operational restrictions. And one of the things that um, we did in Conservation Action 10 was actually just kind of went through that entire conservation action and made it very clear how the operational restrictions applied inside of habitat conservation areas versus outside of habitat conservation areas. So in the previous version, the one that's on the website, we sort of talk about both inside and outside of HCAs at the same time, and it was confusing. Uh, and um, the internal operational review sort of highlighted that. And, and as we want to put this on the ground into the future, we want to make it very clear what is required where uh, inside of the permit area. So that there's some differentiation within that conservation action um, uh, regarding inside and outside of HCAs. And then part of that is uh, when dealing outside of habitat conservation areas, we clarified the requirements for northern spotted owls, uh, marble marilets, and red tree voles, um, noting that there are you know, seasonal restrictions in place um, outside of HCAs when no nest locations are, um, or when there are known nest locations. Um, that, of course, differs than what is happening inside of HCAs where there is ongoing uh, management of habitat, protection of habitat. Um, and development of habitat as part of the biological uh, goals and objectives in the conservation strategy. So we wanted to make that very clear. And then um, I think lastly, some of this has already been said, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but, but specific to the, the habitat conservation plan, um, just wanted to let everybody kind of know what's, what's going on right now. Um, you're gonna hear more about the NEPA process in a second, but um, all of the, the kind of changes and updates that we're making um, the scoping team, as Mike mentioned, is looking at the entire uh, document again. Um, we have uh, some meetings on the calendar with the scoping team to continue to talk about any, any changes or requested changes that they may have. Um, and then we'll be focusing our time in November and December on completing the public draft of the HCP, really incorporating those changes and, and the thoughts from the scoping team. And then um, there, of course, is the December 7th meeting open to the public. So you'll hear some more, um, another update you know, from me then uh, about that process and how it's going. And then um, in, or in January, probably January, 
we will uh, kind of formally submit the permit application to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries uh, with the, you know, sort of statutorily complete HCP, if you will, um, just ahead of the public, the release of the public draft uh, HCP and public draft EIS um, later in the spring. So that's what's happening. There's not a lot, uh, you know, there's not a lot of visibility on that right now uh, with the HCP. It's mostly been a lot of focus on the EIS and on the FMP process, but just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on where we were um, with, with the HCP inner workings. And uh, Sylvia, I think that well, that's the end of the HCP piece. Um, do you want to go straight into the NEPA update? Um, and then we can have a little time for questions. And Michelle, I can uh, stop sharing my screen if you have something, or I can keep this up, whichever is easiest. No, please keep it up, Troy. That'd be great. All right. Yep, go for it. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michelle McMullen. I am with NOAA Fisheries and the co-lead for the NEPA effort. Many of you have met or seen Terry O'Rourke. She is the branch chief for our the Oregon Coast Branch, and together we are shepherding the project through NEPA. So let's talk a little bit about NEPA. NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, is the process used by federal agencies to make informed decisions. For this HCP, we've decided to go with an Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. An EIS is the most in-depth analysis of the NEPA process. For this effort, NOAA Fisheries is the lead federal agency and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a cooperating agency. What that means is that both agencies will use the NEPA analysis to make decisions about the issuance of an incidental take permit for the Habitat Conservation Plan. Many of you may be familiar with the NEPA done by the Forest Service or BLM for federally managed lands. In those cases, those agencies have a huge amount of discretion and they say, okay, tell us what you want us to do on every acre of land. And that's part of the federal lands process that those agencies go through. What we're doing is very, a very different NEPA analysis for the HCP. We are focusing on ODF's proposed action. We are analyzing that proposed action. We are also creating alternatives informed by the feedback we received during scoping. But our focus is on, do we issue the incidental take permit or do we not issue it? In this case, our action under NEPA is that decision about the permit. Want to review some of our NEPA accomplishments to date, where we are now, and our next steps. So our NEPA process officially began on March 8th with the publishing of the Notice of Intent to conduct an EIS. The scoping period was for 30 days originally, but the public asked us for an extension. So we did issue a two-week extension through April 21st. During that time, we held a public meeting on March 31st and information about the process and the meeting is available on both NOAA and ODF websites. Um, Kearns and West, if you could post the NOAA website information in the chat, that'd be great and people can go there. Great, appreciate it. Um, all of the comments that we received during scoping went through regulations.gov and those are still published there if anybody wants to see them. When we received the scoping comments, we examined them in whole and in part, and we assessed all of them. Right now, we are developing alternatives and we use the scoping comments to inform those alternatives. The NEPA regulations also include guidance on how to develop alternatives for the NEPA analysis. So we are also right now finishing up the modeling and the data gathering to wrap up the development of our selected alternatives. Do you wanna note that none of the comments submitted were determined to be complete alternatives on their own, but we did want it to fully embrace the comments. And so we considered the literal suggestions that were provided. And we also considered what we determined to be the intent behind those suggestions. We are doing some deep diving into those suggestions and comments that arose as part of the scoping process. And NOAA Fisheries, we are the ones who are developing the alternatives. As a part of that process, we do coordinate with US Fish and Wildlife Service. 
And we also seek advice from ODF about what is operationally feasible. We then run these alternatives through a screening process to determine and select which ones we're going to carry forward for analysis in the NEPA document. The screening process includes multiple criteria, an example of which is, does the alternative meet the purpose and need for NOAA fisheries? And that is tied to our decision about the incidental take permit. And I wanna stress that NOAA is doing the selection, ODF is not part of that alternative selection. At the same time, we're also working on the draft EIS, which we are expecting to publish early next year, um, in 2022. We're currently targeting late this winter for that. In the draft EIS, we will include a summary of scoping comments, alternatives, and analysis of important topics like economics, geology and soils, water resources, cultural resources, among others. When we do publish the draft DEIS, we will have another comment period where we ask for review and comment on both the draft EIS, which is the NEPA document, and also the draft HCP. The minimum required time for comment on a draft EIS for NEPA is 45 days, but we're anticipating that we will keep the comment period open for 60 days. As an overview of the overall NEPA process, there are four big components. The first is the scoping, which is complete. And you can see this on the slide at the, in the light blue under NEPA. The draft EIS, which is what we're currently working on, anticipating late winter. This will be the next opportunity for public engagement and as noted previously, in addition to comments and on the um, in addition to comments on the NEPA document, the draft EIS, we will also be asking for comments on the HCP. Then there's the final EIS, and then the record of decision. And that is the NEPA update. Unless we're going to take some questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Michelle and Troy. Um, we can certainly take some questions. I know we're also getting to the end of our meeting. So maybe I'll just turn it over. You know, we'll take questions on the NEPA update and the HCP. But before I do that, just for folks that do have to leave at four o'clock, um, you know, Liz, anything you want to say kind of and wrap up and then we'll do our informal, you know, hour on the line for additional questions and comments. Yeah, sure. Um, clearly a lot to absorb. We had some good questions and conversations so far. I've, I'm hoping people can stick around because I, th I think um, maybe there's more questions out there and opportunities for discussion. Um, so I, that's uh, where I would end other than to say thank you again for everyone being here and giving your input. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, great. So then let's open it up to questions and comments from those that can stay on. Um, we do have a couple of next steps, but I'll just put those in the chat. It's the same dates that we um, provided earlier on some of the upcoming meetings. Um, so we'll put that in the chat. And maybe if there's questions on the HCP and NEPA process, we can cover those first and then circle back to the FMP. Um, Ron and then Laura. Uh, thank you. I don't know if my comment where it gets addressed, but um, how do results for the MOU get factored in uh, to all of this planning and what's the timing of that? What? Yeah. Ron, are you referencing the MOU uh, relating to between DEQ and ODF around TMDLs? <laughs> no. Which MOU no. are you referencing? I'm the one between the conservation and the timber uh, interests that uh, oh. Chairman uh, Kelly was talking about at the last board meeting. Yeah, um, so that agreement, you're right, is between industry and the conservation community. We are, we are not engaged in that at all. <clears throat> and so really where it all comes together is as the board thinks about forestry in Oregon. Um, in general, <clears throat> and it's yet to be determined what their role is going to be with the outcomes of that work, that collaborative effort. Do you anticipate that there will be major changes 
that you will have to then take into account as you finalize your plans? I do not anticipate that. It, 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 you know, anything's possible, of course. Um, it, the outcome of that would have to establish protection measures and standards that go above and beyond what we're proposing in the force management plan and the HCP. So if that were to happen, we certainly would fold that in. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, hey Ron. Sorry, I, I mean, Liz, I think when you said we aren't involved in that, meaning the State Forest Division, right? Like ODF yeah. is talking, but it's not the State Forest Division. Thank you for that clarification. That's right. So that's all, um, that nexus is with the Private Forest Division, whereas we're the State Forest Division. So thank you for that clarity, Brett, really important. Yeah, and Ron, I think like Laura will correct me if I'm wrong. I think both Laura and I are, on the outside of this thing largely, but our organizations or entities are talking about it. If, if there's an agreement between those entities, my understanding is that's an agreement related to a separate HCP that would be advanced potentially. And that ties into Oregon Prac Forest Practices Act and rules that's separate from kind of the state forest lands piece of this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And Laura? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick comment. So I think the latest steering and scoping notes on ODS website is from like June or July and we're like mid-October and I'm pretty sure there was some meetings um, since those. So when are those notes gonna be up? And um, you know, it sounds like as you guys are putting the finishing touches on this thing, sorry, my cat just jumped on my desk. Um, as you guys are putting the finishing touches on this, um, you know, can those notes get put up or be shared quicker so that we know what's coming when we are actually able to provide that public comment? Because it seems like that's kind of where a lot of the details are. Um, and so it gets a little like frustrating when the notes aren't shared super quick. So. Thank yeah, you thank for that you, Laura. feedback, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, it's it's a big kind of grind of a public process that we do for the for the HCP, and we were doing monthly meetings with our steering committee and scoping teams. Now we are only meeting with the steering committee every few months, and we're meeting with the scoping team every other month. And so we haven't really had a whole lot of meetings since the summer. We have had just one in September. And so the process is that Kearns and West develops the notes, ODF, then refines them, then we send them to the scoping team for review. And it takes a little while to get through that cycle, but I appreciate your comment. Um, Doug Cooper has certainly kept us honest throughout this process to get those up as quickly as we can. And so we'll definitely do that as we're kind of nearing um, the draft EIS coming out. So thank you for that little poke and reminder. Thanks. Uh, let's see, I see Amy's hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Amy DeFries. I'm with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And I um, just wanted to uh, ask a question about um, herbicides. And I saw the slide where um, that was indicating changes in the HCP and um, I think I understood that that the use of herbicides is no longer um, being discussed in the, the HCP. And I'm wondering why that is. Is it no longer a covered activity? Um, was it originally a covered activity? And, and if so, um, I guess the question would be then, is there has there been a determination that, that herbicide application won't cause take of any of the species? So, um... You, it was originally a covered activity. It is no longer a covered activity, and so it is being removed from the HCP, um, and there has been no uh, determination on take for those. So do you, do you no longer think that it will cause take? Is that why it was removed? So we will, con uh, no. The, the, it was removed um, basically just because of some of the details around us being able to have the 
uh, flexibility to, you know, use the, what we hope are newer and safer uh, chemicals and so forth. Uh, there was no, there was no determination made um, on whether it causes take or not. And so we would simply continue any use, uh, not as a covered activity. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add to that really um, anticipating, you know, we're in a rapidly changing environment with in terms of the herbicides that are available, they're um, uh, increasing um, information around, uh, you know, uh, safe chemicals that have less of an impact. Um, we're also um, looking at potential for new technologies um, so really see ourselves making some uh, the opportunity to make some changes and what needing that flexibility to do that. And then, yeah, really being able to determine um, what the potential impact was, um, was difficult. Robbie, did you want to weigh in there? I see you came. No, I'm just here in case anybody has any other questions around herbicides. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question, Amy. And I also want to note that uh, Michelle McMullen with NOAA Fisheries might not be able to stay for the full hour. So if folks have questions about the NEPA process, um, it'd be helpful to get those in earlier if you have them so that she can answer those. Uh, let's see, see a hand up from Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually have a question about the uh, FMP process, so I can hold that if if you want, Sylvia. Well, let's see, Nancy, did you have a question about the NEPA process? Oh, and you're on mute. More of a comment on the pesticide part of it. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead, Nancy, since that's kind of okay. the topic we just talked about. I, I only recently learned in the last two years that often when the workers, and this was on private land, and I don't know how the state lands are managing it, but the workers, the people actually spraying are often people that are refugees new to this country and reported to me from, you know, people from agencies that the, the, they do not have, some of these chemicals can cause permanent blindness. It is windy down here in the coast steep hills. And these workers were spraying without eye protection without respiratory protection. And then it was also during a time, it still is a time of COVID and you know, they were brought in vans. And I think we really need to look at, you know, this is quote ground spraying. And I used to think, oh, it'd be better if we ground spray, but not if we're putting at risk the health of our new people to our country. And I think, and I called, I tried registering complaints and you know, there's not much legislation covering what happens to the workers. And so I think I really wanna bring that to all of our attention that we need to look out what's happening to the people actually having to administrate these chemicals. I mean, they were wearing regular clothes, closed toe shoes, chemical gloves, but no respiratory or eye protection. So thank you. All of a sudden, it was a time of heavy smoke. It's September 8th, my birthday last year, and it was a red zone for smoke here. And there was spraying right above Wheeler on steep slopes on a windy day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Uh, I think, Amanda, back to you. Okay, hey, yeah, thanks. Um, so I just had a quick question related to feedback now that we've gotten a, um, some revised language on the goals. Uh, it sounds like the best opportunity for feedback is now to go directly to the board, um, but I just wanted to verify that with Odia. Mike, you want to answer that? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> we don't have the uh, survey up anymore or anything like that, but we're happy to take, uh, happy to take input um, on the goals directly. Uh, through the contact information that was provided. Um, you know, of course, uh, uh, feedback to the board um, is also a venue for that. But like I say, th these goals are not being approved uh, by the board in November. Um, and as a matter of fact, they won't be approved until, a, you know, the forest management plan itself is approved. Um, so uh, up until then, uh, 
you know, really there's uh, always a chance uh, or always the opportunity for, for engaging with us. Yeah, I, I got that, Mike. I just wanted to make sure because you had made some mention that you guys hadn't made revisions yet because you wanted to get feedback from the board. So um, just trying to better understand that process and where feedback is is most um, is going to be most useful at, at this point. So. Um, well, a sooner is always better than than later. Uh, and we are looking for that board feedback. That's that is true. And that's one of the reasons we haven't made too many revisions to goals yet. Um, we're, the, the revisions we made, we felt uh, uh, pretty comfortable and confident um, about. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, where the core team is currently spending their time trying to develop strategies. And so trying to find those right times, you know, to get a sizable amount of input and then it's kind of like okay let's turn the board direction and and do that so trying to really kind of balance the workload between all the pieces that folks are working on okay that's that's helpful thank you liz did you want to say more on that great thanks um brett i was just going to ask michelle from noah before she had to leave whether there are any teasers or crumbs as to how many alternatives and what the range of how they meet the purpose and need might be. <laughs> any, any, um, should we all just sit and wait for a while? That's really the best. There will be a range of reasonable alternatives, of course, it is NEPA, um, but we're still in the process of developing those. And when we publish it, that'll be the first chance. Everybody has a chance to look at it. All right, thanks, Brett and Michelle. I see a hand up from Francis. All right, and if Francis, if you're there, you're on mute, or we can't hear you. There, okay, uh, thank you. Um, I had a question on the chemical use when we were talking about the chemicals. Is that appropriate to ask now? Under yes. The habitat yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I noticed in the draft um, habitat conservation plan uh, that coastal martins that are a covered species in the HCP, that the martins were killed by rodenticides that are used to control mountain beaver populations and to protect plantation seedlings. And so the rodenticides is one of those chemicals that was, I guess, a covered activity and now it's not. And I was just wondering if the HCP would restrict the use of rodenticides since it's a take of Martins. Thank you. So I guess just, uh, I'll start the answer to that and then Rob, you can maybe follow me up there. Um, so rodenticides were actually never part of the herbicide uh, covered activity. It was uh, specific to herbicides, um, recognizing that uh, with there are other pesticides that are occasionally used that we don't use uh, really very much. Uh, you know, if we're going to do spraying with gypsy moth, we, you know, or, or for gypsy moth or something, we realize that'd be part of a larger, more coordinated effort uh, across the landscape. Um, and really, our use of rodenticide is. Uh, pretty uh, minimal, uh, at least I'll let Robbie actually weigh in on that. Yeah, so we actually haven't used rodenticide in, in quite a few years on state forests and for mountain beaver uh, populations, we don't use it at all. Um, it, we went, we're going after some, uh, last time we used it, it's probably five years ago and it wasn't for mountain beaver, but something we're moving away from. And I would see the agency not really using it often. And if we did, it would be with like the Oregon Department of Agriculture or something where an invasive species came in, we wouldn't be the lead on it. Um, so we, we, we are not using it on state forests. Okay, um, thank you. So, um, so rodenticides, uh, even though the draft HCP went into how it is a take for Martins, it really won't be used on the state forests at all, it, it's going to be restricted because it's not covered under the HCP. 
It's I wouldn't say at all, but we would very, it would be a very targeted use and there wouldn't be Martin around that area if we were using it going after a very specific species. And it would be, it would have to essentially be a non-native species that moved in for us to really think about. It wouldn't be anything that's out on the landscape right now. And it might be helpful to just explain a little bit about what it means to be a covered activity under the HCP and you know, if herbicides is not covered under the HCP and pesticides, where does that get addressed? Sure. So, um, yeah, because because back to the, uh, I think one one question you're asking there, Francis. Uh, we so the decision not to use rodenticides doesn't have to do with the HCP covered activities or not. That's just a decision that we we don't want to use them, and so we're not going to. Um, the uh, but more specific to the covered activities, uh, we try to incorporate, it behooves us to incorporate as many covered activities as we can that we think might um, cause take of the covered species uh, that we actually envision doing. Um, but we also have to be able to uh, implement uh, a strategy associated with that. If we, you know, for instance, with herbicide and the adaptability to be able to use new uh, herbicides that are less impactful uh, to other forest resources. We really, uh, we wanted to be, have that flexibility. So just because it's something is not a covered activity in the HCP does not mean that we will not be doing it. Uh, however, whatever we choose to do that is not a covered activity um, is essentially uh, done under uh, Section 9 take avoidance uh, as opposed to uh, under the HCP. And so uh, yeah, I was just, oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, go yeah, ahead. I was, Francis, I was just gonna add, um, I'll, we'll, we'll take another look at the language in there just to make sure it's not necessarily confusing and adjust it if needed, but yeah, that Mike's correct on the intent there. That's great, okay, thank, thank you. you everybody. <laughs> and thanks for the question, Francis. Uh, let's see, Trigvi and then Laura. Well, I'm concerned about several issues that relate to the aquatic goal and water quantity and particularly quality. And I am wondering how you're going to deal with the, what I view as the immediate crisis, which is inadequate stream buffers such that Blowdown ends up causing loose soil that can erode very easily into streams and damage water quality for a drinking water source. So there's that kind of immediate, in my view, crisis kind of situation. And then there's the long term issue of broadening things to the point of you get quality watershed protection with older forests that will produce higher quality water in greater quantities and also fix carbon. So you have this kind of bundling of solutions that you can possibly pursue. And I'm curious how you're going to be able to integrate the kind of things that I've just expressed. So I think the most direct example of integration um, in that is that, you know, about uh, about half of the riparian conservation area uh, buffers that we have established under the HCP are within um, under the draft HCP are within the draft HCAs as well, and those HCAs are you know far less intensively managed. Uh, and manage towards habitat outcomes. So in that respect, there is uh, more of an overall uh, sort of protection that you're speaking about um, in those areas. It's not over all the landscape. It is over a significant part, portion of the landscape. Uh, it amounts to about 43% of the HCP permit area. So outside of those HCAs, uh, those remaining RCAs are intended to function uh, and be able to be uh, uh, resilient. Um, I'm not saying there won't be any blowdown uh, there, but with 
the larger stream uh, buffers um, that we have implemented for those, especially around the process protection zone where perennial, uh, perennial non-fish streams, small perennial non-fish streams, uh, 500 feet up from the confluence of the fish stream have an expanded buffer um, that actually uh, are the same as the fish stream, 120 feet on each side before they narrow down to 35 feet on each side uh, is intended to provide uh, some extra protection. Um, and we also have in across all of the riparian conservation areas, uh, regardless of the buffer width um, and also along seasonal streams, we have uh, an equipment restriction zone, which has uh, of 35 feet on either side of the stream <clears throat> that restricts the use of equipment and ground disturbance to help maintain other vegetation there to try and help maintain that proper uh, filtering and sediment routing. So I'm hearing really beautiful detail for HCA and related things. Uh, what about out over the more general forest? Um, you know, ODF forest, obviously that's what you specifically are responsible for managing. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm hearing a clarity. Uh, well, I guess the other way of putting it would be clearly you can identify where you're dealing with uh, drinking water. Uh, and that's what I'm focused on here. Uh, and I'm wondering whether it wouldn't be possible to segment off anything that has something to do with drinking water and provide it with more explicit and higher levels of protection. And that's good input for the strategies uh, when they come out, especially if you have, you know, quite frankly, the more specific, uh, the better in terms of what that extra, you know, shall we say buffering mm -hmm. uh, might look like in your opinion. I, I think on the, um, Basically, one of the things that we'll be doing is, you know, this modeling of forest management plan outcomes <clears throat> for the board so that people and everybody so that we can all see the package of what this produces. And so in terms of the landscape management strategy generally, um, outside of HCA, certainly that's where more of a, there's more of a timber uh, focus, um, if you will, but it's still not exclusive to other things. And we're trying to, part of the modeling process is figuring out the optimization of those other things such as timber and carbon and so on and so forth. And so it's really uh, once we see those modeling outcomes and how the uh, distribution uh, spatially and temporally of harvest occurs uh, as it's modeled out over, over a long period of time, we get a better idea of what that larger level uh, integration looks like there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for those thoughts. When will an appropriate opportunity occur for strategy related inputs? Um, so the most impactful time for that would be uh, in December when we have our meeting open to the public followed by the two joint stakeholder meetings and uh, then we'll be really primed to receive that input on, on strategies from that point going forward is, is the best for us. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chucky. Um, let's go to Laura and then Darlene. Um, I just wanna, on the FMP goals, uh, appreciate adding in the uh, harvested wood products into the forest carbon goal. Um, that's definitely an important thing to note there. So appreciate that. I think some of the other ones have improved as well, but um, kind of getting to Amanda's point, so um, will the board just be, because I think Mike, maybe you'd said at the beginning that this is basically what's going to get delivered to the board in November. So will then they be like wordsmithing during that meeting or are they just going to kind of, you know, look at it and say, yeah, this is good. And knowing that we're going to continue to refine and edit the goals going forward. It's a good question. And, and, you know, a little bit of an unknown, um, obviously with the board discussion amongst themselves, they can, you know, sort of. I guess, choose uh, how much uh, into the details they want to go. Um, I kind of doubt they'll get to the point of wordsmithing. Uh, they may offer some, some definite suggestions. 
uh, to the wording, um, but I think it will probably be in the form of the continuing feedback process over time. I think we probably will get some initial input on what's important to them. And hopefully, uh, actually some really for us, um, understanding of what metrics that they would find valuable uh, in determining if those goals are being met. <clears throat> and that way, uh, we're able to kind of, it, it helps inform our modeling as we go forward as to all the things that we need to include um, in, in that report out on those outcomes. But yeah, um, I, I think it will be from that point forward. I don't think it's the end of the discussion for them in November. Um, we're hoping to get some, some pretty targeted feedback um, on some of the goals uh, from them for sure. Okay, thanks. And I'll just add that uh, they'll be hearing directly from the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee as well and their perspectives around, uh, they did talk specifically around um, prioritizing. So we heard a little bit about that today from someone and the number of goals. Uh, Brett actually spoke to that um, and then some of the language as well. So the board will be hearing, you know, their um statutorily established advisory committee to the board. So that's another voice at the table. Yeah, that's helpful. And I guess that's kind of like my thinking around whether or not they're gonna be like kind of rolling up their sleeves at this meeting and getting into it. Cause they're gonna be getting feedback probably from people now until the board meeting, right? And then right. on the day of the board meeting from FTLAC and part, perhaps in public comment too. So uh, it just sounds like it's kind of more ongoing post board meeting than, than not. Yeah, really hoping we don't get into wordsmithing. Uh, we've been in that situation before yeah. during a public meeting. It's hard to make progress, um, but we are definitely seeking, you know, really good direction um, from them. Just some signals around: Are you on the right track? If not, why? What do they want to see um, being brought back to them? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And Darlene. I, I wanted to go back to the um, um, herbicides and see whether this is now clear to people when something is not a covered activity. And I think Michael addressed this, but I don't know whether it's clear um, that if it is, if herbicide use is not a covered activity, it means there's no pass for allowed take. So it's really, in a sense, more protective not to be a covered activity and that there's no take for a, of a covered species if, they're, if that's not a covered activity. So then the regular regula regulatory system is in place for that activity. So I don't know um, if that it clarifies things a little bit. Thank you, that is, that is absolutely correct. Great, thank you, Darlene. Uh, all right, Michael Calhoun. Hi there. Um, yeah, the gentleman that spoke earlier mentioned again, uh, drinking water. Um, I know things are starting to wrap up. I'm a little concerned because I, I would like clarification about where to go or how to get the ball rolling for, for meaningful change. When I mentioned the area I'm at, it was kind of, um, well, it is surrounded by private forestry. So the, the gist that I'm getting from this whole meeting, it's kind of like, eh, it's private forestry. Um, and I know the moratorium that's going on between the conservation groups and the timber industry, unless I'm mistaken or missing information, it's about, well, creating buffer zones finally for the headwaters, which have none because they're non-fish bearing, and then increasing the buffers for current fish bearing streams. But the conversations I've had with those involved with that have said that drinking water is not a, a factor into that. We're, we're not doing anything special for specifically for drinking water sources. Where can communities like Vernonia go? Because this doesn't seem to be the place and then the moratorium doesn't seem to be the place. Yeah, um, I can see where it hasn't been real satisfying when you raise your concern. So. Uh, maybe I'll give it another try. And, and so it's worth some more thought and thinking about how best to 
to um, continue that conversation from the agency level as a whole. Um, so definitely don't want to give the impression that, you know, that that's not our concern. It is drinking water is really important for us. And we think that um, the water quality that comes off of state forests um, is really beneficial uh, for um, domestic water use. And there's, you know, there's a, a whole different range of what that looks like from very small spring boxes to something more elaborate. Um, and so we strive to we strive to uh, protect all of those, whether they're um, registered or not. Um, and a lot of that has to rely on our neighbors um, understanding what we're doing. And so we advertise our activities um, and then we for some of that stuff, we just need to hear from the neighbors that they're out there. And that's one of the things that came out of the private forests accord. Um, was to update a system that the private forest division runs. It's called FERNS, uh, so that people can register that are not registered under the Water um, Resources Department can register their water source as a domestic water source, um, and then get information as to if, in this case, if there's any herbicide application. That's what that focuses on. I know there's other issues for drinking water quality, but. So that's one um, improvement, I would say just, and then what comes with that is this increased buffer, as you said, around those streams. And then, you know, so that's the large landscape, I would say. And then this does hone down to us as the stewards of these lands, these Board of Forestry lands, what are we doing? And we do, you know, we put some additional protection measures around uh, these streams because of the, our mandate to manage for greatest permanent value. It's a little different than private lands. And so you'll see, um, and maybe next time where we can follow up with you, we have um, wider buffers around our streams. And then we have worked with neighbors, um, typically when they have specific concerns around a particular water source. Uh, the districts will, uh, will work uh, closely with those folks to try to come up with some solutions that um, give people a little bit more comfort as far as what's going on. Does, it, does that help kind of give it that bigger picture? I, I appreciate the input. Um, I, I, I honestly know it, it's cool though. I, I, I appreciate it, but it, it's still with, with ferns, it's like I'm notified when I'm poisoned rather than any of the real effective change. It, it is disappointing. And uh, again, I, I'd advocate Rock Creek same as Bull Run, we need that protection. This is not working right outside. But, yeah. but I do appreciate the input. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And Brett. Um, yeah, thanks. I just want, as we're getting towards the end, I think the role of the November 3rd board meeting, or in part, ODF is going to mm -hmm. say to the board, here's what we're hearing around the FMP goals. And so I wanted to say a few things at this meeting just to be sure you heard it at least from one person. I mean, at first, I guess on the revision of the goals, um, I know several have been revised and one included the um, added language related to the linkage between force management and in-stream flow. And, and um, thank you for that. I think there is a linkage and it's important to kind of recognize this water quality and water quantity are linked. Um, the second one though, is around this notion of prioritizing the goals and um, I mean, I would, I, I fully anticipate you're going to hear more when, you know, I think the county testimony and, and I mean, others on this call would probably, some would agree, like prioritize timber harvest, prioritize that that is the primary goal and the goal should be prioritized with that at the top. And I guess I don't want to speak for anybody else. So I'll just speak for Wild Salmon Center. That's not what we're saying. And in fact, like if you had to do a survey of Others, I, I don't think it'd be easy to rank order the goals. I mean, a lot of these things are important, right? Like drinking water is really important. Wildlife habitat and species is important. The revenue uh, harvest, it's like, okay, that's part of greatest permanent value. It's a large, broad balancing act of public values. So I just wanted to be sure you weren't hearing from, um, we're, we're certainly not saying prioritize the goals. And if you were to prioritize the goals, I don't know who comes out of that 
ring unscathed because um, there are a number of different very important values that state yeah. forest lands produce. And um, we could all probably fight about that for a long time. And prioritization just causes people to fight. Thank you, Brett. Um, and I, I would not promote prioritizing the goals. Um, so you'll, you know, that'll be the space that we're coming from when we talk to the Board of Forestry and, and you know, the message clearly that I would give publicly. And I do know there are a range of opinions out, out within um, our, for our county partners and then for some of our stakeholders as well, that there should be a priority. And there's others, like you say, that, that don't feel that way in my mind. That is the big challenge of managing for greatest permanent value. There, these, this is a lot to accomplish <laughs> um, on our land base. It, we have a complex land base, a complex um, set of interested uh, partners and stakeholders. And um, the, our challenge is to find the best way that we can uh, to provide for those benefits holistically. And I think we had that conversation earlier around, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one goal to strategy that any number of strategies will help us achieve any kind of goal, any specific goal. So we really, uh, we see our, that the task and mandate really under greatest permanent value is to uh, manage holistically. Well, thanks. And Lauren. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, you know, thank you guys for all of the stakeholder engagement opportunities. I know it's not easy to conduct these surveys and public comment periods, then compile all the data and share it out and make these reports. So just want to note that it is very much appreciated and noted. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. And it's not easy for all of you to engage and continue to get this information. It's a lot to absorb and to comment on. So I just have to say appreciation for everyone for staying engaged. Um, Tricky. Yeah, thank you. I want to second Lauren's uh, thanks. Uh, I really do deeply appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this kind of process and to hear the sincerity and um, depth of knowledge that are being brought to these incredible challenges. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. It's nice to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Those are great closing comments. <laughs> Unless there are other questions or thoughts. Is this the easiest? Uh, get out of the meeting off the hook that ODF has ever experienced. I don't quite understand what's going on here. I'm going to write it down in my calendar notes. <laughs> no, it has been helpful. And, you know, I think there's a couple of really critical overarching messages or concerns uh, that I, I understand we haven't yet satisfied people's concerns in terms of how we've answered them or how we phrased the goals and strategies. And um, I just want to say, I hope you, that, that that's not taken to mean that um, we've lost sight of it um, or to diminish uh, your concerns. Uh, I, just to tag on to what um, Liz was saying there, you know, this is, so this is a big process. It'll take a while. Uh, you know, it goes along slowly and we really, really sincerely appreciate people staying engaged along the way, but not to forget, you know, the, uh, that whole thing about the relationship being important. It's really the continued relationship over the years as we move into implementation and right. continued involvement in implementation plans and annual operations plans uh, and just helping, helping us continue to get it right along the way. Um, and that, so looking forward to that. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for your participation today. And of course, we'll be in touch with um, the meeting dates and times for December and appreciate the continued engagement.
So thank you all. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thanks, thank everybody. you.